and joining me right now here on the Mark Moses Show to go over the latest on college football. This guy does a great job on the air, online. Yeah, he does it all. He is Mark Shipper with the Fifth Down CFB. Mark, how you doing today? What's going on, Mr. Moses? I'm doing uh, I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? You know, I thought it'd be kind of slow right now, especially college basketball where we have March Madness. But college football, they, they keep making headlines every single day. Does it feel like that to you as well? Yeah, it does. It's, it's what I've, I've been saying this for a few years with my, have my account and, and when people ask me these kind of questions, college football is mid revolution at this point. So we're, we're undergoing major upheaval in the sport. And it's no surprise there are headlines every day because every day the people who run this thing are, are trying to figure out what to do with it. So a lot of change happening. I've been asking everyone this from the standpoint of we finally get the 12 team playoff, but now last week you have the higher ups who are like, no, let's just go to 14 and let's do this and let's get automatic. <laughs> What's your take, Mark? Yeah. It's hilarious, isn't it? We couldn't even get five minutes of the 12 team planned out without the talk about expansion. We were pretty sure that, it was going to go up from 12. 16 was always the number I'd heard talked about. Uh, 14 kind of came out of nowhere. And I guess 12 came out of nowhere when it happened because a lot of people assumed it was going to be eight. So it's indicative of, again, how unsettled it is. And college football's never done this before. So they're trying to figure out a structure and test a structure and do what's going to be best. To me, 14 is an awkward, strange number. I think if they're going to do that, they should probably just go straight to 16. I'm not even sure where the 14 came from, to be honest. Did you like the 14 playoff over the last decade, though? No, I didn't like the 14 at all. I actually thought that was a disaster for the sport. I thought it couldn't have worked out any worse than it did. It it top-ended the sport. It, um, it, It was... Philosophically, when you when you look at that, a lot of people tried to blame the media and oh, all you talk about is the fourteen playoff, and that's why it's taken on this importance and why the bowl games have been diminished. It's not the media's fault. When you turn something into your championship event, that's what people are going to talk about. You're crowning a champion. That becomes the point of the sport. So you make your championship event a four team tournament. I called it the Invitational. A lot of people call it the Invitational. You've got 135 teams in the division. So when you're a high school kid and you're making your decision to go to college, what do you, who do you want to play for if you have the opportunity? You want to play for one of the teams that's going to play in the 14 playoff. So we watched a system in which I did the math on this, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but if you're talking about the championship game of the CFP, something like north of, at one point, it was 90%. Maybe with this year's outcome, it was, there was a little variety this year. It was like more than 85% of the same teams per- participated in the championship game throughout the life of the playoffs. So it top-loaded the sport. It, it became anticlimactic. It became boring. And at four was a uniquely bad number for college football when you consider the fact it had five power leagues. So <laughs> no matter what, a power league champion was going to be left out every year, which is just it, it is a terrible way to run your postseason, and it was bad, and I'm glad it's gone. We're here with Mark Shipper. I like you didn't hold back with the answer. I like that. And I <laughs> I think I think if you're Florida State, I think you agree with that. Because if we have the 12-team playoff, doesn't last season's Florida State, they're just in, right? There, there's no debate. They're one of the 12 teams. 100%. Last year was a perfect example with Florida State, how it, how it comes down to uh, a media influence. You got ESPN, major – uh, figures saying we want the best teams and we think Alabama is the best team and, and the people who make the selections watch ESPN and listen to ESPN. It's like essentially a corrupted process. So you had a bunch of people who don't play the game uh, essentially saying a Florida State injury means they're not as good as an Alabama team who had a less successful regular season than Florida State. Alabama goes in over Florida State. It, it's It's, you know, again, not holding back. It was a preposterous system an undefeated ACC champion was left out essentially because the opinion was that they lost their quarterback they could no longer hang I mean that that is no way to conduct uh, competitive sports it's a way to conduct maybe uh, professional wrestling but certainly not a, a competitive sport that's meant to be decided on the field see what you're bringing up when they talk about 14 playoff and the 14 playoff and it's like 
oh, well, we want four teams automatic qualifiers from the SEC. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What is it? Why even play this sport then? We should just just have a playoff with the selected teams, and we don't even have a regular season. That's my take. What about you, Mark? Yeah, that's that's what makes me angry about it. And, and it's strange because there's a lot of cognitive dissonance I hear from people, which is they're upset that college football's regular season is being devalued in their opinion. I don't really agree with that. I think you can make some arguments around the margins that certain elements might not be quite as important, but I think the essence of the college football season is going to remain untouched. All, all these games are going to stay important. But the dissonance comes when they say we must – keep the importance of college football's regular season, but no auto bids for the playoffs, meaning you could go undefeated, win your league, and in theory, you might not be selected for the playoff because we're letting human beings and equations and debates decide the postseason format. I don't know how you do this thing without auto bids because you have to reward the regular season. So, again, if, if you want to keep the regular season important, you better have conference champions um, automatically put in your postseason because they proved how good they were during the regular season. So, yeah, I think there's there's a whole bunch of problems and exactly what you're alluding to, which is putting throwing this into a committee room and having people debate who belongs in the postseason to play for the national championship is, is kind of a um, an uncomfortable way to do this. I'm, I'm looking for the right word. It's, it kind of uh, it makes you squirm, makes your skin yes. crawl a little bit that that's how it could go down, but... You know, that's what we're looking at. Look, I grew up rooting for Northwestern. They were right in my backyard. But if they're the fourth best team in the Big Ten and they go eight and four, I don't need them in the playoff. <laughs> I'm sorry to use that analogy. <laughs> I don't need to see them. I don't. If you're if you're Notre Dame, Mark, what do you do then moving forward? Because you're not in a conference. Yeah, well, they agreed to this system, so... Notre Dame, I think, sees this a few ways. Obviously, their their national brand remains powerful. A lot of people live in denial of Notre Dame's brand. It's it's a huge brand in a massively important school to college football. And the reason they're agreeing to this process is because they know if they have a great season, they'll be selected, Mm -hmm. and Notre Dame doesn't have to play in a conference championship game. So people saying, you know, Notre Dame could never get a first-round bye. They actually get a bye by not playing in a conference title game which could, you know, affect your auto bid. It could affect your status in the playoffs. So Notre Dame would play their extra game in the first round of the playoffs. That may be a little bit tougher road to go. But, again, remember, they don't play that conference title game. So I think Notre Dame is okay for this with this for now. But I actually think this postseason is going to finally compel Notre Dame into a conference. I think the only two independents left are UConn and Notre Dame. And um, I don't think major college football is going to allow the one independent outlier to float around and do whatever they want and, and still access the postseason. So I do think Notre Dame eventually will be uh, leveraged into a league. We're here with Mark Shipper. All right. Is there going to be a Pac-12 conference next season? Because I get confused by this. <laughs> yeah, I think they're calling it the Pac-2. Uh-huh. And... Um, Oregon State and Washington State are going to play a largely independent schedule, a bunch of Mountain West crossovers. And, um, you know, that's a sad situation for them. I I think this thing has to continue evolving. and They may end up back in like a Western division. If the sport continues to shift and we sort of reorient conferences into divisions and make it like a 50 or 60 team top league, Mm -hmm. I think Oregon State and Washington State get put back into uh, uh, the the high major level. But if it stays with this just unwieldy and ugly setup we got now with the massive SEC and the massive big and everybody else kind of floating around, I think Oregon State and Washington State are going to be in trouble. So their their futures are definitely uncertain. Um, You know, I feel bad for those schools. I really do. The hesitation in your voice, I think, says it all, where no one really knows what's going on here. So my my follow-up is, Do we need like a Roger Goodell type commissioner to corral everyone in with all the nuttiness we've had over the last 12 months or so? Yeah, hopefully not a Roger Goodell-esque personality, (laughs) but a a Roger Goodell-esque figure. Um, I think a commissioner could work. Uh, You know, you hear Greg Sankey's name tossed around. He, He seems to understand the sport pretty well and college athletics well. Yeah, I think there could be a, 
a, a place for a leadership position like that. But, you know, the thing about college athletics and um, people really need to understand this is it's an extremely unwieldy operation. And, and when you look at the difference between the NFL and college athletics, the NFL all work toward a singular goal. They, they, all their revenue comes in, they share um, everything that, that the NFL makes essentially outside of, you know, individual franchise stuff, stadium gate and parking and that kind of stuff. The NFL shares everything. College athletics, these colleges compete against each other for everything. And I'm not talking about just athletics. I'm talking about for students. I'm talking about for federal grants. I'm talking about for rankings. Mm-hmm. So these universities are in many ways motivated not to work together. They, they, um, they are fighting and scrapping for everything in the marketplace for themselves. So getting the colleges all to come together, the Big Ten and the SEC to join up and, and everybody else to join up is, is more difficult than it sounds because these guys are competitors in every arena. So sharing everything does not come naturally to the colleges. Do you even understand how the playoffs going to work? Like <laughs> next December? Cause I still get confused. Like, are we playing on Christmas? What's happening? Yeah, I, I have to look over the schedule exactly how it's going to go. Again, unwieldy is just the word for everything. We got early on-campus games, then we got bowl games, then we got basically playoff games, which uh-huh. are separate from bowl games. And it's just, it's a it's a chunky operation. Uh-huh. So, I, I mean, I, I basically know how it's going to work, but I don't think anybody knows how it's going to work until we actually see it. All right, you're a fan of Georgia, BAM, Ohio State, the, the real – Big time programs. So they want you to go to championship Saturday at a dome stadium. Then they want you to go to a playoff game. Then another playoff game. How are you paying for all this? If you're the average consumer, that's what I get confused on. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that either. It's a great question. It's why it needs to be streamlined. Yeah. Can you imagine that? I mean, the SEC championship game, you can pay six, seven, eight hundred bucks for a decent ticket and thousands of dollars for a good ticket. Yeah. And then what? You go to the Sugar Bowl and that's sold out. And then you go to a, a semifinal and that's sold out. And then a championship game and that's sold out. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you, what's the fan laying out for that experience I, if they go from league championship game? To national championship, do you just need ten thousand bucks or what? Yeah, see, you don't. The other thing is, you don't know if your team's going to win. So, how are you? Are you just buying tickets in advance anyway? In a game you might not even go to. That's I. This is why this is so crazy. We're here with Mark Shipper, fifth down CFB. Uh, it's going to be fascinating to see. Okay, my next one. So on signing day earlier this month, at Florida, Billy Napier who's going to have the hardest schedule in the history of mankind this fall. That's another story. They ask him on signing day about NIL and how they can compete with other schools. And how's the NIL doing right now, the collective at the University of Florida? What is your thoughts moving forward on NIL? Because we still have other states like Virginia, Tennessee. They're fighting with the NCAA going to court. What is your take moving forward on name, image, and likeness then? Well, my first observation is we're not, in many ways, we're not doing name, image, and likeness when it comes to the collectives. There are some token deals thrown out and some very light duty contracts signed, you know, go to uh, the local children's hospital and hang out for a few hours, run a camp on school on a Saturday, and some other kind of light duty stuff like that. And then you get your your NIL value, but really it's, it's roster value. It's a payroll. So what's going on right now is these third party collectives are essentially building a payroll for the schools, which is to say, how much money does it take to keep these kids rostered? And the boosters and donors and fans are expected to come up with, you know, four to 10 million bucks a year, whatever it is Mm. to keep these guys on the roster and, and keep them happy. Name, image, and likeness was meant for players to go out in the open market and endorse things or take deals from local businesses to do exchange work for them, like true open market stuff. The collective NIL is, like I said, it's it's just a shadow payroll for the school. So it's it's a very weird operation. I think that's why you hear people talking about um, revenue sharing and contracts and, and making the athletes employees because – then they can start divvying up all the media rights money and all the revenue the schools get and start paying their athletes out of that as opposed to having your fans 
uh, cover your payroll <laughs> expenses I, for you, which is certainly not what NIL was meant to be. So uh, NIL is bizarre. I don't think it lasts too much longer in this form, but it will be a few years. So if you want to compete, you got to get your fans donating. You know, we saw it in UCLA with Chip Kelly. He did a absolutely horrible job of uh, engaging UCLA's wealthy alumni base to donate to NIL, and UCLA's football NIL was very underfunded. So that's just one example. So that's kind of my my position on NIL. So it's interesting because this goes back on the fan. You want me to donate money to the school like they've done for decades, but I need to do that and I need to give money to the collective as well. That's what's interesting. So if I'm the average fan, do you give money to the school or do you give money to the collective moving forward? That's my question. Yeah, if you're the average fan, you got to make a choice. You can't donate to the athletic no. department and the NIL and then get ready for the playoffs and everything else. So, yeah, you got to make a choice. I think if you're the average fan, you probably want to donate to the NIL because you want to get the players that will help you win. So I think that's probably where your money should go now, which – again, creates another conflict with the schools. You talk about schools competing over everything and competing over dollars. Now schools are competing with their own collectives Mm -hmm. for donor dollars between the roster and the school. they got to make that choice, so it's it's awkward. And there's no guarantee the player's even going to go there. Or he might jump ship in a year as well. There's no guarantee in any of this stuff. Let's end with this. Right. My example is Caleb Williams, where – He potentially could be the number one pick in the draft to the Bears. I feel like he's the first kind of trailblazer where he jumped ship to another school because of his coach, Transfer Portal, and he went a whole year with NIL money playing at USC. Do you feel like, moving forward, when you look at the NFL draft, every every big-time player is going to be like that moving forward with college to the NFL? Uh, yeah, I think he's probably a pretty good paradigm. He, it's really interesting. My, I made a big national tour of this sport and went to all the great rivalry games and stuff. That's the part of the the book that I'm working on. And I actually got to witness the Caleb Williams movement. I saw his breakout game, the red river shootout, 2021, Texas, Oklahoma, Caleb Williams came in after halftime scored on like a 51 yard touchdown run in his first snap, read a huge comeback for Oklahoma. And then that off season, Lincoln Riley, Oklahoma's coach, leaves. Caleb Williams follows him, and and you know I was basically witness to that whole thing. So, yeah, you saw him out at USC. He's driving around a uh, Porsche. I don't know what exactly that car costs hundred twenty, hundred fifty thousand bucks. Um, living in a beautiful apartment downtown Los Angeles, um, but play, living and playing like a professional athlete essentially at USC, and now moving on to the NFL. Um, he could have stayed in college if he wanted to. He, he was he was certainly living the uh, the king's life downtown L.A. and at USC. But now he's moving to the NFL and he will make more money there. But of course now he's a he's a full time professional. So yeah, I think Caleb Williams. When you're talking about those really high end guys, that's pretty much how they're going to be. They're going to live like professionals in college, and then if things work out like they wanted to, they'll they'll join the NFL at their own pace. Are you sold on Caleb Williams as an NFL prospect? No, but I. But let me say this: I, I am very wary of projecting quarterbacks to the NFL because I've had uh, I've had too many misses. I've been humble, and uh, what I've realized is unless I'm going through a team's tape and and getting insight in terms of what that quarterback is doing, is he reading the defense? Is he changing plays at the line? Is is he, um, you know, making full field reads and decisions in real time, or does he have an offense that's tailored for him to get plays from the sidelines, snap the ball, throw to a, a pre-determined uh, order, you know, one, two, three receiver, and it, has he been helped out that way in college? Because those guys go to the NFL, and if they can't process fast enough, they fail no matter how much physical talent they have. See what's in- um, and and on the other side of that, you mm-hmm. see guys in college who you think, well, they're okay. You know, I don't know that they're great, but you find out they're making all the decisions in the offense, and they're much better suited to transitioning to the NFL, where the coach gives them the play in the helmet, and then everything is up to them at the line of scrimmage and on the field. So, Caleb Williams has massive physical talent. 
whether or not he um, is ready to process in the NFL, it, it's a wait and see. So I'm not sure about him. Physical talent, 100%. Tell us about the book you're working on then. Yeah, my book, uh, it's, it's, um, I, I set out in 2021 uh, and I said college football. This was before, you know, all these things that started to happen the, the transfer portal, the Supreme Court decisions, the mm. Texas, Oklahoma to um, the SEC, UCLA, USC to the Big Ten, et cetera. I said college football is on the verge of a uh, revolution, and I want to experience the old game uh, before it's gone forever. National Odyssey went to all the big rivalry games. You know, I spent a week in Florida, Miami, Florida State, University of Florida, um, SEC championship game, Red River shootout, USC Notre Dame, all the big ones. And my story is how college football over the years has been inseparable from American history and culture in a very unique way and how the sport's changing and, you know, what we're going to lose because of that and, and what the sport's going to look like going forward. It, it's not a pessimistic book. It's just an honest book about college football in the United States. It's, it's a huge part of our history, far beyond the field itself. And, um, yeah, so it's going to be a travel book, uh, an experiential book, and then just kind of a look at college football. That is awesome stuff. His name is Mark Shipper with Fifth Down CFB on the Twitter. Can't wait for the book. Mark, thank you so much for your help, and have a great day, man. Yes, sir. Appreciate you, Mark, every time, and I look forward to talking to you again.